Hello, welcome to another video of our MBCN series. My name is Dr. Mariam, and today we're going to be learning how to examine the cranial nerves MBCN style. But before we begin, please take a moment to like this video and subscribe. So for the examination of the cranial nerves, we're going to divide it into two parts. Part 1, which will cover cranial nerves 1 to 6, and part 2, which will cover cranial nerves 7 to 12. So for us to know how to examine the cranial nerves, we have to first familiarize ourselves with the cranial nerves. So we'll take a moment to go through the cranial nerves 1 to 12 in this table. So as you can see, cranial nerve 1 is the olfactory nerve and is purely sensory. Cranial nerve 2 is the optic, which is also sensory in function. Cranial nerve 3, which is oculomotor, is purely motor. Cranial nerve 4, which is trochlea, is also purely motor. Cranial nerve 5, which is the trigeminal nerve, is both motor and sensory in function. And cranial nerve 6, which is the abducens nerve, is purely motor. Next, we have cranial nerve 7, which is the facial nerve, which is also both sensory and motor. Cranial nerve 8, which is the vestibular cochlea, which is also sensory only. Cranial nerve 9 and 10 are the glossopharyngeal and the vagus respectively, and they are both motor and sensory in function. Cranial nerve 11 and 12 are the accessory nerve and the hypoglossal nerve, which are also purely motor. So now that we've familiarized ourselves with the cranial nerves, let's learn how to examine them. So, to begin our examination, we're going to greet our patient and then perform our wiper as usual. So, we've already done that and we're going to begin with the examination. So, the first cranial nerve we're going to examine for is the olfactory nerve. To do that, we need to ask the patient and then assess. So, sir, have you noticed any changes in your smell? No. Okay. So, after asking, we need to assess. So, to assess the function of the olfactory nerve, we need to examine each nostril separately by giving the patient a familiar scent that they know of and asking them to block the other nose and then smell with the corresponding nose. So they'll block the other nose, they smell with this nose and then we switch. So that's how we examine the olfactory nerve. The next nerve to examine is the optic nerve, which has many parts to its examination. The first is inspection of the eyes and the pupils. So Sam, can you please open your eyes and relax? We look straight at the pupil, examining for symmetry and size. In a normal light environment, the pupillary size is between 2 to 4 millimeters, while in a dark environment, the pupillary size is between 4 to 8 millimeters. After that, we test for our visual acuity using the Snelling chart. There are two types of Snelling charts. You can have one on the wall or a pocket Snelling chart, and the unit of measurement differs. If it's the wall one, we usually use meters, the metric system. If we're using the pocket one, we usually use feet. So how we test for this is we're supposed to put this 14 inches away from the patient and then ask them to read the last, which is the smallest line on the chart. And if the patient wears glasses, we actually need to ask them to keep their glasses on and we examine one eye at a time. So to begin examination of the visual activity, we place the pocket snelling chart about 14 inches away from the patient and we ask the patient to use their palm to cover one of their eyes. So can you please cover? So can you please read the smallest line you can see, this one? E-O-Z-F-P Thank you, sir. Can you cover this eye now with this hand? And read, and read the line again. E-O-Z-F-P Thank you, sir. So using the pocket smelling chart, if the patient can read the smallest line, we say the patient has a vision of 20, 20. That's 20 over 20. Meaning at 20 feet, the patient can read what a normal person can read at 20 feet. Let's say this patient could not read the last line. We keep moving up until we reach a line where the patient can read. Let's say that line is 20, 80. So how do we interpret this now? So it means at 20 feet, the patient can see what a normal person will see at 80 feet. If we're using the wall Snellen chart, the unit of measurement is different, and that's usually in meters. So the normal one for the wall Snellen chart is 6, 6. So when we say a person has a vision of 6, 6, 6 over 6, it means at 6 meters, that patient can read what a normal person can read at 6 meters as well. Let's say the patient has a vision of 6, 12. That means at 6 meters, the patient can read what a normal person can read at 12 meters. So after inspection and doing the visual activity, the next step in examination of the optic nerve is the color vision, usually Ishahara cards, which we will skip in 
this time because they're all likely to ask you during the examination and frankly because I don't have Ishihara cards. After that, the next step is doing the visual fields. And to test for the visual fields, we need to determine each eye individually and for each eye, we need to test the four quadrants. So the upper outer quadrant, the lower outer quadrant, the upper inner quadrant and the lower inner quadrant of each eye. So how we do that is we ask the patient, sir, can you please use this hand to cover this eye? So sir, I want you to keep your head straight and keep your eyes on me. I'm going to be moving my fingers like this, but I'm going to start far away from you and I'm going to be moving it close to you. When you start seeing it, the moment you start seeing it, I want you to tell me, yes, I can see it. So we're going to start with the four quadrants of the left eye. So this is the upper outer quadrant. See. This is the lower outer quadrant. I see. Thank you. So please keep your hand like this. And for us, we switch. Because we can never be seen crossing our hands, we need to switch to do the inner quadrant of the left eye. So, sir, we're going to repeat the same thing. Tell me when you start seeing my finger. I see. This is the upper inner quadrant. I see. Thank you. And this was the lower inner quadrant. So we're going to switch eyes now. So sir, can you please cover this eye? Yeah. And thank you. We're doing we're going to repeat the same thing. Tell me when you start seeing my hand. I see. I see. Okay, sir. So keep your hand like that. We're going to go on this side. I see. So the patient should start seeing your hand moving at about the same time you can see it as well. So for us to be able to interpret this, we need to know the visual pathway, which starts from the optic nerve to the optic chiasm to the optic tracts to the optic radiations, which has upper and lower to the optic lobe. So a lesion in the optic nerve will lead to a complete blind eye of that side. A lesion in the Optic chiasm will lead to bitemporal hemianopia or tunnel vision, meaning the patient can only see straight and cannot see peripheral vision. And then a lesion in the optic tract will lead to something called anonymous hemianopia, meaning the patient will not be able to see the same quadrants of both eyes. So, for example, if a patient has a hemianopia of the outer quadrant, he's going to not be seeing the outer quadrant of both the left and the right eye. If there's a lesion in the optic radiation, it leads to something called a quadrantinopia. And remember, because everything in the eye is opposite, meaning if you hear left, it means right. If you hear up, it means down. For example, if you have a lesion in the left superior optic radiation, you're going to have a right inferior quadrantinopia. And lastly, if there's a lesion in the optic lobe, you're also going to have a kind of hemianopia. The difference between this and a lesion in the optic tract is that in optic lobe lesion, there will be macular sparing. So, so far in the examination of the optic nerve, we've done inspection, visual acuity, color cards, and visual fields. So the next step is the pupillary reflexes. So the most important thing you need to know here is when examining the pupillary reflexes part, you're not only testing for cranial nerve 2, which is the optic, you're testing cranial nerve 2 and 3 together. So you're testing for optic and oculomotor because the afferent limb is carried by the optic nerve, which is the sensory part, while the efferent limb is carried by the oculomotor nerve, which is the motor part of the reflexes. So when we test for these reflexes, we're testing for both optic and oculomotor, and there are three reflexes that we test for. The pupillary leg reflex, which includes direct and consensual or indirect, the swinging leg reflex, and the accommodation reflex. So to test for the direct leg reflex, we need to stabilize the patient's head while asking the patient to look straight. We're going to use a pen torch as our light source, and we're going to swing it from the side. We should not be seen bringing it close to the patient directly because that will affect our reflexes or how we see the reflexes. So to assess for the direct reflex, when we swing from the side and shine it on that eye, we're looking on the same eye that we're shining on. While for the consensual, when we swing the light on that eye, we're actually looking at the opposite eye. So let's start with the direct reflex. Sir, can you please open your eyes? So ideally the light is supposed to be dimmed and we shall start bringing our light source from the side. So as we bring it towards the pupil, we should be seeing the pupil constrict. So while looking on the same eye, and that's the direct. So we have to repeat that on the opposite eye. So do the same direct on the opposite eye, bringing from the side while looking at the same eye that we're shining on, and the pupil should be seen constricting. And that's the direct reflex. For the consensual reflex, we do the same thing, swinging from the side, 
but we'll be looking at the opposite eye to see if the opposite eye constricts. The normal response is the opposite eye constricting in response to like being shown here. We'll do the same on the opposite side while looking at this eye. So to understand the direct and consensual leg -like reflex, we need to understand the pupillary reflex pathway. And before we mentioned that the afferent was carried by the optic nerve, which is the sensory part, while the efferent is carried by the oculomotor, which is the motor part. So when we shine a light on the right eye, the right optic nerve carries that impulse and goes to the pretectal nucleus. So the right pretectal nucleus, however, sends information to both the right and the left. So it sends both ways. So Impulse from the pretectal nucleus is sent to the edingorespal nucleus and parasympathetic fibers in that edingorespal nucleus hop on to cranial nerve 3 which is the oculomotor nerve and travel back to the eye carrying the motor response. So what this means is when there's a defect in the direct reflex, it means the afferent nerve on that side is affected, meaning the optic nerve on that side is affected. But when there's a defect in the consensual, meaning we shine, and this one constricts but the other one does not, which is what we're supposed to be looking for anyway in the consensual, it means that the afferent or optic is normal. But it's the efferent or the oculomotor that's defective because it's the one responsible for carrying that efferent back to this eye. So. A uh, defective direct means afferent problem. A defective consensual means efferent problem. So the next reflex to test for is the swinging leg reflex. And what we do here is we just shine the light and swing it from one eye to another, and we should be seeing both eyes constrict. So in the case of a relative afferent pupillary defect for the Marcus Gump people, when we're swinging the light, instead of constricting, one eye will have paradoxical dilation of the pupil. Lastly is the accommodation reflex and to test for this we just ask the patient to look forward So can you please look straight ahead focus your eyes there and then we bring an object close to them Like this and we ask them to look at the object. So can you please look at this one? The normal response is a convergence and constriction of the pupils So as a side note in the case of algebra of a sonium pupil which can be seen in diseases like syphilis The pupillary light reflex is absent while the accommodation reflex is preserved. The last step in examination of the optic nerve is doing a fundoscope. So the next cranial nerves that we're going to test are actually tested together. So cranial nerves 3, 4 and 6 which are oculomotor, trochlea and abducens are all motor nerves that supply the extraocular muscles and are tested together. There are 6 extraocular muscles, superior rectus muscle which makes the eye look up, the inferior rectus muscle which makes the eye look down, the medial rectus muscle which makes the eye look in, the lateral rectus muscle which makes the eye look out, the superior oblique muscle which makes the eye look down and out, and the inferior oblique muscle which makes the eye look up and out. So all the extraocular muscles are supplied by cranial nerve 3 which is oculomotor except the superior oblique and the lateral rectus muscle. The superior oblique is supplied by the trochlear nerve while the lateral rectus is supplied by cranial nerve 6 which is abducens. So you can remember this via the acronym SO4LR6. So SO4 is superior oblique trochlea and then LR6 is lateral rectus abducens. So to test the extraocular muscle movements, we're looking for any pain or ophthalmoplegia in the eye of the patient. Sir, can you please look forward and open your eyes? I want you to keep your head straight and look at my finger. Now I want you, while keeping your head straight, follow the movement of my finger with your eyes only. Okay. So we make a H sign and we ask the patient, Sir, do you have any pain in your eye as well during this? Do you have any double vision? So, as the patient answers, we observe the eyes to see if there's weakness in any direction. After that concludes examination of cranial nerves 3, 4, and 6. This is probably a good time to mention that in an oculomotor nerve injury, there will be ptosis, which is complete ptosis, myodriasis, and the eye will be down and out. So, the ptosis is due to a defect in the supply to the levator palpebris superioris. The eye will be dilated or myobritic because the parasympathetic nerve fibers are also damaged along with the oculomotor nerve so the sympathetic fibers will take over and the eye will dilate and then the eye will be down and out because all the other rectus muscles will be defective except the lateral rectus and the superior oblique which will make the eye go down and out so the lateral rectus will pull it out the superior oblique will pull it down and out as well so what's the difference between the ptosis in cranial nerve 3 damage and ptosis in Corner syndrome. 
So the torsus and cranial nerve 3 damage is actually complete torsus because of damage to the supply to the levator palpebrae superioris muscle, while in Horner syndrome, the torsus is incomplete because it's the tarsal muscle that's affected, which is a minor load than the levator palpebrae superioris. The other components of Horner syndrome includes meiosis. The eye will be constricted because Horner syndrome is a defect in the sympathetic chain. So because the sympathetic nerves are affected, the parasympathetic nerves will take over, which will constrict the pupil. And the other, the last part of Horner syndrome is anhydrosis because sweat glands are also supplied by the adrenergic nerves. Can you think of a two that's associated with Turner syndrome. Take a moment to think. It's usually Pankot's tumor, which is an apical lung tumor. Lastly, in this video, we're going to look at cranial nerve 5, which is trigeminal, and trigeminal is both sensory and motor. The trigeminal nerve has three divisions, V1, V2, and V3, which represents the ophthalmic division, the maxillary division, and the mandibular division. The ophthalmic and maxillary divisions are purely sensory, while the mandibular division has sensory fibers and motor fibers that supply the muscle of mastication. So to test for the sensory part, we're going to test the sensory supply to the face via V1, V2, and V3. So there are three parts to testing the trigeminal nerve. First comes sensation, then comes reflexes, then comes motor aspect. To test for the sensory supply to the face, we use a simple cotton wool. We ask the patient, sir, I'm going to use this on your face. I want you to close your eyes and then tell me when you feel it. But before we begin, this is how it feels like. We test it on the patient's sternum. So can you please close your eyes, sir, and say yes if you feel it. Yes. 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 So that covers the sensory supply to the face. Next is the reflexes. And there are two reflexes that we do for on the face. The first is the corneal reflex, which is not normally done because it requires us actually testing the cotton wool on the patient's cornea. The reflex is for the patient blinking upon contact with the cotton wool. And then the jaw jerk reflex is when we ask the patient to simply relax their jaw. Sir, can you please open your mouth a bit? Open your mouth a bit and just keep it, relax the jaw. So how we do the jaw jerk is just we place one finger and we hit. If it's exaggerated, there will be a brisk closure of the jaw. The last part of examination of the trigeminal nerve is testing the muscles of mastication, which include the temporalis muscle, the masseter muscle, the medial pterygoid, and the lateral pterygoid. So to test, we ask the patient, sir, can you please clench your teeth? So we're testing for the temporalis to check for any wasting. The masseter, sir, can you please open your mouth? Thank you. Open your mouth. Don't let me shift it to the other side. So, it's important to know that the lateral pterygoid opens the mouth while the medial pterygoid closes the mouth. That concludes the cranial nerve 5 examination or the trigeminal nerve examination. And we've reached the end of our video. We're going to continue with the other cranial nerves in the next video. So, make sure to watch that, please. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, please leave it in the comment section below. Don't forget to subscribe. And I'll see you in the next video.